Well, uh, thank you so much, Hagar. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Uh, I'd love to take you on a journey, a journey of connecting the dots and how can we create our own good luck in this world. To give you a bit of context, uh, I grew up in Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, I uh, was kicked out of high school, had to repeat a year, probably held the unofficial world record of how many dustbins you can knock over on your way to school when you're driving. And then one day I wasn't so lucky anymore and crashed into four parked cars, all cars completely destroyed, including my own. And I won't forget the policeman who came to the scene and who was like, oh my God, he's still alive. And that idea that I was supposed to be dead, that stuck with me. Uh, and I asked myself all these weird questions, you know, if I would have died, uh, who would have come to my funeral, who would have actually cared, was it all worth it? And at that point I had mostly depressing answers. And uh, so it took me on this intense search for meaning, trying to figure out what is life all about. And I started reading a book, highly recommended, especially for the times we live in now, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, which is all about the question, how do we find meaning in tough circumstances? And when reading the book, what I realized is that what gives me meaning is connecting ideas, connecting people, and seeing how it all uh, comes together, and that spark that comes from it. And so on that journey then, as community builder, entrepreneur, and later in academia, what I found fascinating is that wherever I went, whatever I did, the most successful purpose-driven people, they seem to have something in common, which is that they intuitively connect the dots. They intuitively cultivate serendipity, this smart luck that I'd love to talk about today, and I'd like to dive into what are some of the practices that we can all use to have more of this in our life. Because it's a pity that usually we look at the unexpected as a threat, right? We look at it as something that destroys our plans, where usually we make a plan, right? Then life happens, and then we again talk as if it was step by step by step. You've probably all done it with your CVs, right? Where you uh, go to your future employer and you say, well, you know, I always wanted to do this, and then I went here, and then I went here. Yeah, or maybe you just ran into someone at a conference and then randomly ended up somewhere. The point is we tend to airbrush the unexpected out of our stories because it makes us feel in control, it makes us feel we have the authority, and so on, which is a pity because a lot of times, actually, the most beautiful moments come out of this unexpectedness. And so that's really what serendipity is that we'll talk about. A couple of examples of serendipity. Here's an amazing organization in the Cape Flats in Cape Town called uh, R Labs, Reconstructed Living Labs. It's people who come out of very tough circumstances, and they said, okay, why don't we set up an organization that uses very simple uh, low-cost education modules, for example, 10 steps to use social media to build your business, and then we go into other poverty contexts, and instead of looking at people and saying, what do you need, and putting them into the role of a victim, of a beneficiary, we ask them what's already here, and how can we make the best of it? And so they would do things like look at a former drug dealer and say, fantastic, that person will be very resourceful, that person will have a lot of social capital, and if we can turn them into a teacher, we can turn a local community around. They look at an old garage, they see a potential training center. And with that kind of mindset, what I found fascinating is how often they create locally smart luck wherever they go. And one of the recent occasions was, you know, COVID happened, and they offer a lot of their courses uh, in physical spaces. And so from one day to the other, they couldn't offer these physical lectures anymore. And so what they realized is suddenly, well, maybe we can use WhatsApp, the service that a lot of you might use, to produce nano courses. And so what they did is courses via text messaging, which now after COVID or, you know, hopefully after COVID or in the at least kind of post, uh, most dramatic COVID phase, became one of their key services that they're also selling to other companies and so on out of these unexpected occurrences. This is another example of serendipity more recently where uh, BioNTech, a German company, uh, they were working on RNA technology to tackle cancer. COVID happened and they realized, oh wow, we can use our technology to develop vaccines against COVID. That's how first, one of the first vaccines together with Pfizer, um, they took it to market and it came out of there. And one last example of serendipity, if you have uh, erratic hand movements like I do, you spill a lot of coffee. And so imagine you spill coffee in a coffee shop over someone, and they look at you slightly annoyedly, but you sense there might be something there. You don't know what it is, you just sense there might be something there. Now you have two options, right? Option number one is you just say, I'm so sorry, here's a napkin, you walk outside, and you think, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with a person? Option number two, you speak with the person, that person turns out to become the love of your life, your co-founder, your employer, you name it. 
The point is our reaction to the unexpected, us making the unexpected meaningful, that's what serendipity is very often about. So what we've done over the last decade is to map different examples of serendipity from around the world, from the CEO of MasterCard to the social entrepreneur in, in, in the Cape Flats in Cape Town, trying to understand, despite the stories being so different, is there a pattern behind this? Is there a process of how serendipity comes about? And is there a science-based framework for how we can create this kind of smart luck? And what I found fascinating is, the more we've been working on this, the more we've realized, wow, this smart luck that serendipity is, is very different from the blind luck that we usually perceive as luck, right? Where it just passively happens to us, like being born into a nice family, things like this. That's where a lot of the societal inequality comes from, right? That people are just passively kind of, something happens to them that's good. But serendipity is about smart luck. It's about luck that we work very hard for. And so what the fascinating thing about this is, at some point then, it's not either working hard or having luck, but it's working really hard to have more luck. And so what do I mean with this? All of the examples I mentioned before, and examples like Viagra, penicillin, up to 50% of innovations and, and inventions, potentially how you found the love of your life and so on, are serendipitous. And it's always the same process. There's some kind of unexpected trigger happening, right? An unexpected serendipity trigger where you spill the coffee, um, or I can, uh, you know, there's this wonderful uh, example of the potato washing machine, I'll, I'll tell you in a second, that, that kind of illustrates that even more. But so there's some unexpected trigger happening, COVID, you name it, and then you have to do something with it. You can't pick that situation a lot of times, but you can pick your response to it. How do you interpret this accident? What do you do with it? And then we also, of course, a lot of times need the tenacity to actually go through with it. Not enough to just, you know, bump into your potential love interest. You've got to have to go on a couple of dates, right? And not enough to just have this brilliant idea. You actually have to work on it to make it happen. So serendipity is a lot of times a long process. It might start 20 years ago, and then today you might realize, oh my God, now I have the big idea that was incepted actually a long time ago. And so um, this is always the same process that we can then work on. We can create more of these serendipity triggers, so we can create more meaningful accidents, or we can make accidents more meaningful. And I'll talk about a couple of ideas of how we can do that. And of course, in organizations then, the exciting thing is that we can create enablers and constraints for that serendipity to emerge. Now, but briefly, the potato washing machine, I don't want to keep you from, from one of my favorite examples of serendipity, where a couple of years ago in China, there's a, a company that produces washing machines. And they, you know, produce washing machines, refrigerators, and they receive calls from farmers. And the farmers told them, your crappy washing machine is always breaking down. Well, why is the washing machine breaking down? Well, we're trying to wash our potatoes in it, and it doesn't seem to work. So, what would we usually do? We'll probably try to educate them, right? To say, well, don't wash your potatoes in the washing machine. It's for clothes. It's not made for potatoes, right? They did the opposite. They said, you know what? That's unexpected. But there's probably a lot of farmers in China and in the world who have a similar problem. So why don't we build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine? And that's how unexpectedly so the potato washing machine became one of their key products. Again, there was something unexpected, but they connected the dots to something meaningful. They did something with it and then had the tenacity to go through with it. Now, I'd love to ask you in the audience, who of you considers yourself to be lucky? Hands up. Lucky? Do you consider yourself to be lucky? So the right side seems to be very lucky, the left side less so. Um, I think we, we'll have some conversations later on, I guess. Uh, but, uh, but so, um, the reason I'm asking you is that those of you who consider yourself to be lucky are more likely to be lucky in the future. Not because of some voodoo kind of stuff, but because you might perceive life differently. You might see more in the unexpected. And I'll give you a couple of, of examples why that's the case and a couple of experiments. And no, no worry, everyone can, can, can work on having, having more of that luck. But there's one experiment I'm a big fan of where it's a very entertaining one, but there's a lot of other kind of more, um, you know, rigid ones where they pick people who self-identify as very lucky. So people who say, good things tend to happen to me, yada, yada. And people who self-identify as very unlucky. So people who say, bad things tend to happen to me and so on. They pick one of each and they say, walk down the street, go into a coffee shop, grab a coffee, sit down, and then we'll have our conversation. What they don't tell them is that there's hidden cameras along the street and inside the coffee shop. There's a five-pound note, so money, in front of the coffee shop door. And inside the coffee shop, there's only one chair empty next to this extremely successful businessman who can make big dreams happen. Now, the lucky person walks down the street, sees the five-pound note, picks it up, goes inside the shop, 
orders the coffee, sits next to the businessman, they have a conversation, exchange business cards, potentially an opportunity coming out of it. We don't know that part. The unlucky person walks down the street, steps over the five-pound note, so doesn't see it, goes inside the shop, orders the coffee, sits next to the businessman, ignores the businessman, that's it. Now, at the end of the day, they ask both people, how was your day today? The lucky person says, well, it was amazing. I found money in the street, made a new friend, and potentially an opportunity coming out of it. The unlucky person just says, well, nothing really happened. And the point here is that our alertness to the potentially unexpected, us expecting that it might be there, that it might be in a conversation, that it might be when I look on the street. I find a lot of money in the street, uh, unfortunately, mostly pennies, so it doesn't really improve my lifestyle. But uh, it, the point is, once you open your eyes to the potentially positively unexpected, it tends to happen far more often. And so, what are other strategies for us to be luckier? Um, one of my favorites is the hook strategy. The hook strategy is all about the question, how can I think about relevant talking points that are important to me? So, you know, for some of you it might be, I'm currently looking for a job in XYZ field, but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano, you name it, and then building that into every conversation you have. Someone who does that really good is Ollie Barrett, uh, an entrepreneur in London. If you would ask him this dreaded what do you do question that you get at every conference, hopefully not here when you're outside and, and talk with each other, but um, um, he, if he gets that question, he wouldn't just say, I'm a technology entrepreneur. He would say something like, I'm a technology entrepreneur, recently read into the philosophy of science, but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano. And so what he's doing here is he's giving you three potential hooks where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence, my sister is teaching on the philosophy of science, you should give a guest lecture. Oh my God, such a coincidence, we're hosting piano sessions, you should stop by. The point is, I'm a big fan of really writing down what are some areas in your life at the moment that you're curious about, that you want to learn more about, that you want to have an opportunity in, and then building that into every conversation right here after the session, because you never know who in this room might have a sister or brother or mother or daughter who might actually do exactly what you're looking for at the moment, but you can't know this if you don't put those hooks out there and allow other people to connect the dots for you. Same with the kind of questions we ask. Do we ask the kind of what do you do questions and put people into boxes, or do we slightly reframe them into what do you enjoy doing? It's one small change in the question, but what you're doing is you're allowing the person to get out of their autopilot response and to really talk about what they're really excited about, which makes it far more likely that there's overlaps. A second practice is to, to really think about what is some kind of North Star or some kind of curiosity that I have. It makes it easier to connect the dots if I have a feeling for what to connect them to. Um, but I think there's a lot of pressure, you know, especially on young people to find their purpose and their passion and everything else. I don't feel, um, you know, what we see a lot in our research is it's usually a key curiosity that helps us a lot if, if we're curious about something um, and especially curious about other people. This one here, um, some of you might have seen this painting, um, but, you know, there's a lot of practices that can help us have more serendipity in our life. But one of the things that I found um, you know, interesting when kind of studying this a lot is that we all have self-limiting constraints, right? There's always objective constraints. So someone who gets born in the Cape Flats in Cape Town has a very different potential serendipity base level than someone here who has access to networks and education. And so there's objective resource constraints and we have to work on that as well. That's kind of like a policy question, that's an organizational question, and that has to go hand in hand with the mindset. And then at the same time, in every context, we see that people develop mindsets that can help them have more smart luck. But one of the things that holds us back then is self-limiting beliefs and biases, right? So a lot of times, in my case, for example, it might be something like fear of rejection, right? Imagine the, the, uh, the coffee shop situation and imagine you wanted to speak to that person or to that speaker at the conference, but you felt like, oh, that person might reject me. They might not have time for me, whatever it is. And then you hold it back and one thing that I've realized is I always thought the worst thing that can happen is the sting of rejection, right? Someone not having time, whatever it is. But then I've realized the worst actually is the thinking about what could have happened, the regret that comes with what could have happened. And so once you reframe that away from what's the worst thing that can happen if I do it to what's actually happening when I don't do it, then actually you realize, oh, I actually should speak with that person, I should come up with that idea in the meeting and bring it up and stuff like that, because regret is the worst thing that, of course, uh, can happen. Um, so to wrap this up, um, you know, a lot of the kind of things that I've talked about are kind of tactics and, and we can work on a lot of these kind of different questions, but I think a lot of it comes back to the kind of Viktor Frankl notion that we can't always pick the situation we're in, but we can always pick our response to it. 
And I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's Margaret Mead who had this beautiful idea that you should never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world, because indeed it is the only thing that ever has. And, you know, we live in a world that is for most part socially constructed, right? A lot of the assumptions we have, you know, then COVID happens, and a lot of the assumptions just don't work anymore, right? And so the, the beauty of this, though, is that because everything is socially constructed, you can shift a lot, you can do a lot, and you can create potentiality. And that's what serendipity is all about. Serendipity is about potentiality. It's about seeing a little bit more in a situation, in a person, in a moment, and then doing something with it and turning that into positive outcomes. And that's why I'm so excited about it. That's why I hope also it might uh, affect some of you in your lives. And uh, with this, thank you so very much and uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you.